Unity, we did really a lot. Uh, he had positions at MySQL, AD, and Mozilla Foundation. He wrote and contributed to several books on PHP, MySQL, and the free and open source software. Please, give him a warm welcome, Zach Grant. And I'm not sure if, there we go. That should have both mics on. So today I'm presenting on the age of literate machines. This is a talk I was uh, saddled with um, some months ago by a colleague who had to cancel an attendance at a conference. He wanted to present on a session that he was going to call a visionary look at open source. And I thought this was a fairly big topic to try and tackle. I uh, sat down to think about whether or not I could do it, and then decided I might as well try. This is the result. So if you've got questions or comments, I'm easy to mail, firstname at lastname.com. So first, what is free software and open source? I'm presuming that most of us are programmers or free software and open source power users. Well, let's go with my view. Two terms for the same thing. Throughout, I'll use the term generally free source, uh, sorry, free software, <laughs> not free source. A complete new term that no one understands, no. I will use free software to refer to, to both at the same time. So the thing that these two terms are referring to, it's software that everyone, no matter who they are or where they are, has the freedom to run for any purpose, to study, to copy, to modify, and to share, even if they choose to sell the copies or give the copies that they modify to friends. Free software matters for a few different reasons. One of the first ones is that it protects our freedom as people by helping to ensure that we get to examine and study the software that governs our lives and that we rely on. And this ranges from simple things like looking at software that we use on our own computers to determine how it works and what it's doing to hopefully being able to examine things like the software that runs voting machines, where it's very important that as human beings we're able to figure out what a machine is doing in theory on our behalf. Free software also acts to enrich the public domain. Now, the public domain is our shared cultural and intellectual heritage, and it includes um, things like the works of Cervantes, the great Spanish writer, um, this engraving by uh, Auguste Doré, the uh, great engraver. Um, of course, all of da Vinci's works are in the public domain, free for anyone to use. It's interesting to note here that even though da Vinci's works are in the public domain, people can still build proprietary works on top of them and extend them. Dan Brown, who I would guess most of you are familiar with, the author of The Da Vinci Code, is now a millionaire mostly because he has managed to combine many elements of knowledge from the public domain in a unique and interesting way, including da Vinci's works. So free software is also an engine of commerce. Huge companies, IBM, Sun, HP, these are the ones that we, we tend to know about using a lot of free software, to lesser known users like uh, BP, a rather large oil company, use a lot of open source software. Um, Apple's an interesting example here and that they decided to build their new operating system, even though it's not that new by now, uh, Mac OS X, on top of BSD. It's really interesting that Apple, which has a history of being a very proprietary organization, has, in its new incarnation, decided to base its own offerings on top of software written by other people that it did not employ, and that it has no formal legal relationship with beyond the free software license that uh, the software is distributed under. Of course, the software in question is uh, primarily BSD with a lot of other free software tools added into the operating system. Interestingly, that same, parts of that same chunk of software that are OS X are also in the iPhone uh, and various other offerings they have. Even Microsoft, uh, generally considered a longtime enemy of free software, now has what they call an open source software lab, port 25 for probably good reasons, I'm a bit skeptical, but who knows what will happen in a few years. Now, keep in mind that Microsoft, as an organization, still appears to be very, very dedicated against free software. 
Most of their activities are not at all friendly towards anything that we consider community. Part 25 is a small exception here, but I wouldn't really trust them yet. By yet, I mean within the next decade, at least. So, of course, we all know that Amazon, Google, and Yahoo are using huge amounts of free software internally to ship massive amounts of traffic around the net. Um, Yahoo, for example, has a mostly free software stack internally for delivering their traffic. It's a very hacked up stack. If you look at their version of Apache, it is relatively unlike any other version of Apache that you may have ever seen. But it's still free software under the hood. Uh, the, uh, the interesting thing here is that all of these companies offer proprietary services, but it's all built on top of a free stack. Of course, free software is also a tool for science. The very largest computing project that we've ever undertaken, which is, of course, the net, is built on top of open standards and free software. Many other important scientific efforts, things like um, uh, decoding the malaria genome, for example, have been run on tool stacks that consist of a lot of free software. In short, most computer users, most people, end up using free software. And it doesn't matter if you're a government or a terrorist or a military or a church or a nonprofit or a for-profit company. Most people end up touching free software in some way. So what's the vision in all of this? Maybe this sounds like a revolution or something that's really interesting, and it is. But in all of this, free software is just an effect. Now, don't get me wrong. Free software is still a revolution. The choices that free software advocates open source evangelists, programmers around the world are choosing to make around free software and open source are really changing the course of computing and the course of our modern societies. But it's still not the reason that IT and society is changing. It's just something that's happening because of a greater effect. And if we want to know what that is, then we can look back at history to see what led up to free software and open source, what other things in society have happened in the past that are similar, and maybe get some clues on where we might be able to go in the future. So how many people actually recognize this? Ah, not too bad. An amazingly viral piece of work. So this is, <laughs> sorry, just had to drop it in. Uh, this is John 1.1. 1, 1. More precisely, this is an English translation of a, uh, well, from a lot of different sources of John 1.1. 1, 1. And it's a really interesting piece of work. We'll talk about it a little bit as we go through this presentation. Let's, let's read it out. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what the hell does that mean? Semantically, it's pretty ambiguous, which is what makes it so very interesting uh, and such an interesting touchstone for this presentation. To a Christian, this has one of many different meanings, which various Christian theologians will debate. To scientists, it could be bent to have another meaning. So some millions of years ago, we're not sure, look at this, this handsome specimen here, some distant relative of ours perhaps. Um, some millions of years ago, we began to develop a precursor of what we would consider modern speech. This really marked some massive turning point in, in our history as a species. Some scientists believe that we really ended up evolving with language, not because of language, and not in spite of language, but as we developed an ability to communicate more meaningfully in a vocal fashion, we started being able to take advantage of other opportunities in the environment. And as a consequence, we started then becoming better at communicating in this fashion. So, ah, actually, let me back up. Well, this is a good enough slide. So here you can see roughly the modern state of the human mouth and tongue and so on. Some of those changes that we underwent were physical changes. We developed a tongue that was better suited at pronouncing complex sounds. We developed teeth that were also an aid to this. We developed a rib cage that was good at giving us breath control so we could have longer, more coherent utterances. There are a lot of other small changes that happened so that we could get better at language. But we didn't really develop language until a long time afterwards. Our best guess? which is still a, a guess, is that about 40,000, 50,000 years ago, we developed something that we would consider today real language, real spoken language. 
um, a series of symbols attached to sounds that could convey a broad range of both abstract things, like how you're feeling, and concrete things, like where something is in the world. And, well, one, one thing I'd like to point out at this point in time, we've jumped basically from a scale of millions of years down to tens of thousands of years, and now we're jumping down to about a scale of thousands of years. Humanity's gone from being um, basically apes down to having some sort of tribal, larger culture based around communication, which leads us to three important things, grain or agriculture, beer and taxes. So here's the grain part. We've had language for about 30,000 years and we end up figuring out that grain is something that we can cultivate. And it makes, it makes life on one hand easier for us and harder for us. It makes life easier because we can grow a stable crop and harvest it and have food to store over the winter and so on. And it makes life harder for us because it introduces a whole series of food-related diseases, keeps us in the same place for a long time, which humans weren't really built to be doing, and ends up causing some other health-related problems from all the work associated with agriculture. But it still does let us form stable societies and also ends up letting us develop real processing of beer. So some people actually, as an aside, some scientists think that the beer piece came before agriculture, that we developed agriculture because this was the best way to produce beer very quickly. <laughs> I suspect that this theory was developed in a pub somewhere. <laughs> so one other note, when I, say, when I say beer, you probably think this. When I say beer for most of this presentation and until we get to much later on, don't think this. It's cool, refreshing beverage. Think large bowl of room temperature fermented porridge that you kind of have to eat with a spoon instead of drink out of a glass. So we have beer, we have agriculture, and we've started seeing some changes in society. Uh, in order to keep track of the agriculture that's going on, in order to deal with having large societies that are possible with agriculture, we end up starting to develop systems to keep track of the cultures. So one of the systems is we end up developing a more formal type of taxing system so that within our society we can have more specialized roles. We can have some people who farm and some people who provide other services like making beer. To keep track of this and to keep track of other very important pieces of information, we, in this case, the we I'm talking about is Sumerians, and some other ancient cultures in the Fertile Crescent, what we today call the Middle East, develop uh, a form of writing. Now this is a later form of it, and I'll talk about it in a second. The early form of it consists of simple symbols that are very good at tracking the amount of some physical good and who's given it to you and when. It's basically a very simple language for describing problems related to accounting. So, it's a lot like early computer languages, which also tended to describe problems related to numbers, accounting, censuses, and so on. From this early set of symbols, we end up developing the first real representation of spoken language. And here's an example of that. And given the topic of this talk, not coincidentally, it is a recipe for beer. So it is the uh, tablet of Ninkasi. It is both a poem and a recipe for how to brew beer. That's relatively a, a complex process. I'm surprised. This tablet is about 6,000 years old, and it describes a multi-step process for making a nice fermented beverage. Someone's even tried to brew it in modern day and distributed it. Apparently, it's very sweet. They didn't have hops. Instead, they made a, a, a loaf out of barley. They baked it several times. They added some malt and did some other things, but without any agent to make it bitter, it might be considered a bit undrinkable by today's standards. From this, I'm just going to skip this slide. From this, we started seeing a much broader use of, of written language in society. Um, the Sumerians had a very long uh, society with a lot of use of writing throughout it, so we'll be looking at them. This piece of writing comes about a thousand years after that clay tablet that records how to make beer. And this is a very famous piece of writing. Most of you probably even know it, even though you don't know it by looking at it. Who's played Civilization? Okay, great. Um, 
one of the very first upgrades that you can get is the Code of Laws by Hammurabi. So this is the Codex Hammurabi. This is the stone tablet that Hammurabi's Code of Laws were carved on. Hammurabi was an ancient god king of Samaria. He, as far as we know, was the first person, well, I'm sure those must have been first, but this is the only record of society. This is really quite fascinating because when you look at these laws, they're incredibly strict. Um, if you have a translation, and if you assume the translation is correct, and you grep through it for occurrences of the term death, specifically put to death, out of about 150 translated laws, there are 22 instances of put to death. These are laws that you want to pay attention to. By writing them down, Hammurabi gave his people, at least those that were literate, consider at this point in time your average citizen is not literate. You have a very specialized class of people, scribes, who know how to read and write. They are basically the programmers of the day. They encode data and they decode data. And they're really the only people that can do this. Others either don't read and don't really have an interest, or they're wealthy, they're kings, and they hire people to do their reading and writing for them. Again, much like programmers today. But anyhow, by choosing to write down these laws, he suddenly gave people a way, people in his society, a way to study what the laws meant to try and avoid breaking them. To study the laws, perhaps if you can read without the intervention of a legal scholar or a priest. Here's a sample of the law, of one of the laws. It's rather strict and very thorough. So not only if you steal from a temple, but if you receive stolen goods from a temple, you shall be put to death. Very nice. So we've jumped through a huge amount of time, basically a few million years in just a few minutes, and things will start slowing down now. We're roughly at uh, about 6,000 years before the birth of Christ, as we guess roughly. Let's jump forward about 2,500 years. And this gets us to what in today's buzz language would be called language 1.0. In language 1.0, you have a whole series of cultures, mostly around the Fertile Crescent, what we consider the Middle East, who have at least a class of scholars who can read and write, professional scribes. We also have language in some other areas. China has developed a, uh, um, uh, a rich and complex system of, of writing. They have scribes and so on. This, of course, leads up to censorship 1.0. As more and more writing gets commissioned, and as writing moves away from being something that simply governments, kings, the state, etc., commissions, to things that are religious in nature, to being much more commonly used, it starts to mean that control moves from states more into the hands of people. And we start seeing censorship efforts meant to deal with this. Um, at this point in time, I would love a glass of water. Where? Oh, thank you. It's lucky that wasn't a tiger, it would have eaten me. So one of the classic examples of censorship in the ancient world comes to us from the very dawn of, of what we consider modern Chinese history. Um, a bit before the, a good chunk before the birth of Christ, an emperor called Qin Shi Huang ended up unifying China through military might. Once he had accomplished this massive task, which consisted of, well, uh, unifying a very large physical area, with many different people spread across it, with many different languages, he decided to try and cement his rule by ensuring that there was coherence of thought and coherence of dogma in this new country. And what he did was he went through and, uh, with the help of his scholars, his personal scholars, tried to find and burn every single piece of writing that disagreed with the philosophies that they developed. To be very thorough, he also commanded that roughly a thousand scholars were to be put to death by being buried alive to make sure that no one would recreate these books. 
it's a terrible tragedy because you consider how much history was courted in these works and how much was lost. The ironic thing in this is that after this mass slaughter of scholars and this mass burning of scrolls had been done, Qin Shi Huang's own advisors had the gall to complain. And they complained that what they were left with was incomplete and useless. It seems pretty cause and effect to me, but perhaps it didn't seem so at the time. Or perhaps given that the, mm, well, there are scholars that got put, buried alive and there are scholars that didn't, and you might want to choose sides at that point in time. An interesting illustration of this is that even at this early stage in writing's history, people started understanding that language really was one of the roots of freedom. Qin Shi Huang would not have been worried about burning some insignificant pieces of paper if they hadn't had a tremendous amount of meaning, if they hadn't been an agent for social change, if they hadn't been a tool for allowing people to think about the current state of affairs. You can do all of these things with spoken language as well, of course. But with written language, you have the ability to abstract yourself from the, from the, the written work. You don't have to be there in person to discuss with someone, to share an idea in writing with them. The other interesting thing out of all of this is that language is the profound tool. So language does all sorts of useful things for us, but at the end of the day, there's no other tool that we have that lets us actually discuss matters of God, matters of spirit, um, write poetry and so on, other than language. Um, it is if you believe some linguists, which I tend to on this issue, language is basically thought to us. It is a physical manifestation of thought. Um, even more so, it's become how we think. Um, so how many of you, well, I assume that all of you speak English if you're here, <laughs> but I would guess that most of you speak, or most of you think in German and end up translating on the fly. Um, I did an experiment some years ago when I ran across George Lakoff's writings of trying to think without words. And I didn't get that far. The number of concepts I could try and describe were very, very limited because I had no way to describe them without using English vocabulary. So let's leave the Chinese for a bit and return to where we have been previously. We're back to the Fertile Crescent. We're back to the Middle East. This is a Torah. This is a relatively modern copy of the Torah. The Torah, of course, being roughly the Old Testament. The, fun, the, the foundational uh, holy book for the Jews. The Torah is um, a collection of cultural and religious beliefs of the Jewish people over a long period of time. We're not quite sure, there's a lot of discussion about when it was first recorded uh, to paper, but it's been at least 3,000 years, as near as people estimate. It's a very interesting work um, in the way that most religious works are very interesting in its content, but its effect is most interesting of all. When the Jews chose to write down these works, it meant that they had to have, of course, people to write them down. And that's fine. By this time, most people in their, most cultures in the area had scribes, people who were good at this. But the challenge was, what if you wanted to make sure that people other than scribes could read your religious writings? Well, they made a fairly simple choice, and the choice was that Everyone, in this case, unfortunately, everyone basically meaning men, um, should be reading the Torah. And a choice was made by the culture that people should start studying it. And you saw an interesting change in Jewish culture at this time. Once the Jews had chosen to start reading the Torah, it meant that every person in the society had to know how to read, had to be able to deal with the relatively complex concepts expressed in the Torah, because it, it does contain, it's a large, first, it's a relatively large written work. For the time, it's a massive written work. If you consider that most chunks of writing we get are, are small fragments uh, of not very large works, the Torah dwarfed them in size. So you have an entire culture of people who can read and write, who can deal with complex topics, um, who have all the tools needed to read and write. So we forget now that things like this piece of paper this incredibly cheap commodity that costs much, much less than a cent would be tremendously, unbelievably expensive by modern terms to produce. If you think about the process for making uh, papyrus or um, 
uh, uh, paper from animal skins, it's hard to believe how difficult it is if, you're not, if you don't have good machinery in place to make it. So the Jews have all these great things put together. And you see a renaissance in Jewish culture around the time that they become literate and gain all the tools to write effectively. They become very good at a culture at doing administrative things, things that are very much aided by you being able to write and then read back information. Interestingly, actually first I should explain what this is. So this is a coin Greek copy or translation, we're not sure, of John 1.1. Well, actually, of the first page of John, which includes John 1.1. 1, 1. Um, it's obviously a Christian writing. John is from the New Testament, not the Old. Christians had to make the same rough choice that Jews did, but for slightly different reasons. The choice was they had to learn how to read and write because as they became more popular, as the religion became more popular, they also became more persecuted. The ability to write down their beliefs meant that they could easily share their ideas without having to be there in person to be persecuted. This was fairly important for them, and it would provide an important way to let Christianity spread across great distances and times without necessarily having a person to do so. So here's another interesting and important written work. So this is a Quran. Um, actually, I should back up one step. So for, for time scale, this is about third century AD. So we've jumped ahead about another, oh, let's say roughly 500, 600 years. So let's jump ahead roughly the same amount of time to look at the Quran. So Islam is a younger religion than Judaism or Christianity. It's about 13, 14 centuries old. The Quran is, um, um, of course, the collected uh, religious, well, not all of them, but the core of the religious writings of uh, Islam as a faith. Initially, it was spread through, the beliefs were spread through word of mouth and so on. At some point, a clever, perhaps, or just lucky uh, Muslim cleric, a mufti, to be technical, made a decree called a fatwa. And this decree was that every observant Muslim must learn how to read so they can study the Quran. And you saw an interesting blossoming of, of Muslim culture around this time. In the same way that the Jews benefited from becoming literate and that Christians benefited from becoming literate, not all Christian traditions, but some. Um, you saw some of the uh, Muslims becoming greatly benefited by being literate as a society. I think the classic example would be the Moors in Spain. So the Moors were Muslims, they conquered Spain, they had a very interesting society in that they were extremely permissive for the time. They tolerated many other faiths, uh, including Christianity and Judaism. They had excellent math, I think because they were literate. They were able to study ancient texts like the ancient Greek texts and so on to gain additional knowledge. It was just another language for them to learn. All of this, I think, because the entire culture could basically read and write so they could study. Now, we haven't seen this in all cultures. It's not that not all Christian cultures were what we'd consider literate, especially over time. They waxed and waned. Not all uh, Islamic cultures were literate. It waxed and waned. But those that did choose to be literate found they had tremendous benefit. I'm going to try to get a little bit more precise now, and I'm going to move into territory that's a little bit more familiar. But let's start again with John 1.1, 1, 1, since it's a recurring theme. So this is a 14th century British translation of John 1.1. 1, 1. And in many important ways, it's wrong. It doesn't actually get through the complex meaning of John 1.1 1, 1 in a proper way. But it's not surprising at all that it's wrong because of how it was produced. It was produced by this wonderful heretic, John Wycliffe. John had this interesting heretical belief. And first, this is John here pictured opposite of one of his translations of the Bible. This is a much later version. It's rather pretty. The earlier versions weren't nearly so nice. So John had this, for the time, completely insane belief that the Bible was the source of all wisdom regarding spiritual matters. This was very much at, very much at odds with the church at the time. So in this case, mendicant means begging. 
So we have a cleric, John Wycliffe, who believes that the only source of true knowledge about God and spiritual matters is through the Bible. But there's a problem at this time, and the problem is not this, it's not that he got the translation of John 1.1 1, 1 wrong, because he was the translator, it's actually that there's no easy way for British Christians, for English Christians to be more precise, to study the Bible, because the Bible that is currently available in early 14th century uh, England is the Vulgate, the Latin translation, or a Latin translation of the Bible. It's been copied many times by people who are not that expert of scribes. It has errors, omissions. Most people in England do not speak Latin. Only priests and some scholars do. And while it's well and fine to have a belief the Norse influences, uh, some much more strongly reflect the French invaders and so on. So he has a very large task that's made even more complicated because John is barely what you would consider literate by today's standards. So he and a team of others make their first translation. And it's bloody awful. It really is. Um, across the Bible, you have different spellings for the same word. You have different translators using uh, different dialects of Middle English, which makes it a very difficult work to read. But it's okay, it's a lot like open source and free software development. It's a really good start. It is an alpha. And they sit down and they work out, over the course of Wycliffe's life, two other complete translations. And by the time that we get to the end of the translations, we end up with this work, which is much prettier, much more accurate, because the people who are translating start to work with others, they start to study the Greek texts and the other old texts that they have access to. They become literate, which is amazing. Over time, they make themselves literate. And they do it in part by making things consistent and accurate, but they also do it in part by defining what written Middle English is. Wycliffe's Bible fundamentally changed England. And here's why. If you think about the state of writing in Middle England, there are very, very few written books. Even the Vulgate, the Latin Bible, which priests rely on, is in very limited distribution. We're talking hundreds of copies at most. Um, most people have no real thing to reference, to read. Your average person, even your extraordinary person, does not really have a library. Um, they're lucky if they own a book. A book is worth roughly as much as a house. They're incredibly rare and valuable things. So the state of Middle English literature is, is very, very poor. Wycliffe ends up providing a book that everyone wants for interesting reasons in a language that they can understand, that at least is more useful to them than Latin. It ends up providing the base of modern English literature. It gives writers a work that they can study to understand how to express difficult concepts and how to express them in a way that you know that other people have been reading. It provides a great touchstone, a Rosetta Stone, if you will, not just for a few key fragments, but for an entire language. So it really was a fundamentally transformative work. Um, it's the work that Milton and Shakespeare and many other great English writers based their work on. And it was incredibly dangerous work as well, because this is what usually would happen to people who did things like this. Uh, this is Bohemian Jan Hus. And this is the church burning him at the stake. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, John Wycliffe didn't avoid the same fate, but he did manage to avoid it until after he was dead. But 20 years after he passed on, the church was still so angry that they found him, dug him up, burned his bones, and then threw them into the river. I think by that point in time, he may not have cared. <laughs> so. I'll hit these points again briefly. The important thing about Wycliffe's Bible was yes, it did give Christians religious freedom. It gave them the freedom 
to study the Bible and even consider disagreeing with a priest on what the Bible meant. And this is important. The Bible played as much a role in what was acceptable in British society as the laws did. So it was very good to be able to study it. It was very good to be able to disagree and to think about these issues. But it also provided a meta tool. And the meta tool was, here is a guide to how to write. Here is a guide to how to express difficult concepts. It ended up becoming an important tool for people to think with, and a way also for people to collaborate about thinking. Once you have a good written uh, vocabulary to work with, you can express com complicated ideas. You can write letters to each other. You can end up moving so that you don't just think within this group of people that you know, you get to think across a much larger scope, and you don't have to be there in person to do it. So this is, I guess, the pre, 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 pre alpha of the web. So let's look at another very interesting heretic. And most of you are probably even familiar with this person by this portrait. So how many people recognize him? OK, and how many people here aren't German? Oh. So the only, yeah, there are only one or two Germans I can make fun of for not recognizing Martin Luther. So Martin Luther is an amazing figure in history, incredibly vulgar, um, uh, defiant, um, a horrible anti-papist, an even worse, an even worse anti-Semite, and like Wycliffe, he also chose to translate the Bible, and for roughly the same reasons. But there's a really key difference between Wycliffe's Bible and Luther's Bible. And you can see it here. This is a printed book. In Wycliffe's time, he had no access to printing technology. When he duplicated the Bible, he duplicated it through the work of human beings, through brute force, basically. And with Luther, Luther could print up copies of his Bible. And his ability to make the same changes in his society that Wycliffe brought about in English society was magnified at least a hundredfold. Instead of um, a few hundred people having access to a Bible, which is what it was in England, Wycliffe's Bible, even though the church, well, we're making guesses here, the church found as many copies as they could of Wycliffe's Middle English Bible and burned it. But the best guess that we have is that there are somewhere between about 200 copies of his Bible and maybe 500 copies. Well, imagine having 10, 100 times as many copies floating around of the same work and magnifying that much social change. It's enough so that you can easily have a Bible for many villages that people can study. The other interesting thing is that Luther, as I mentioned, was also an anti-Semite and an anti-papist. And he also published works on these topics. And they were really amazingly vulgar. The illustrations in his work on, uh, or his work against the Pope, uh, creative, vulgar, not viewable by people under 18 in most cultures. Um, his work on the Jews, certainly what we'd consider awful, awful hate speech today. It advocated violent death for Jews that didn't convert to Lutheranism, not Catholicism, but to, to, to some sort of Protestant religion. The fascinating thing, there are several completely fascinating things in this. One of them is Luther has this profound belief that wisdom about God and the spirit and life comes from the Bible. So, Let's go back in time, about well, 2,000 and some odd years. You are a Jewish scribe, or you are a cleric, and you are busy writing out your holy books. Possibly you're copying them, possibly you're, you're documenting them for the first time. How could it even occur to you that some thousands of years later, some person in a culture you can't even imagine coming to an existence will read the works you have written and come to the conclusion that your descendants must be exterminated. This is probably not what you meant by writing. You weren't writing between the lines, um, by the way, please kill all my descendants. My son really angered me today. Inconceivable stuff. The other interesting thing in this part is that my remote, if it works, there we go. The church worked very hard to censor Luther's printing of the Bible and some of his other works. They didn't care so much about the uh, work against the Jews. But what if they had managed to successfully censor both of these works? It would have been a tremendous loss. Now, 
one of the key things that I think that I've learned by studying this area is how freedom of speech ends up coming into play. While Luther should, Luther's works were terrible in one sense, depending on who you are, the fact is that people were able to study both works and come to their own conclusions. This is demonstrated somewhat clearly. Actually, no, let me, before I go onto that slide. So the freedom to read is in essence the freedom to think. If everyone in a society has access to ideas except for you, and they're never described to you, or they're not described to you in a way you can study, you lose the ability to think with them about the issue. For example, the Bible. If you are a peasant in medieval times, and a priest tells you something that is supposed to come from the Bible about what you are supposed to do with your life, what choices do you have? You can't exactly argue with him. You're not literate. The Bible is not in your native tongue. You will do what the priest tells you to do unless you wish to go against the church, which is a very powerful entity. But once these peasants were able to read a work in their own language, so once German peasants became able to read the Bible, things changed because they could actually debate with the priests, with their rulers, about what the meaning of something was. And this provided the most important tool for thought that they could have. It was really a tool for choice and for freedom. In the end, if Luther had been censored, it would have denied a very important tool for choice. And the end result is that even though he did publish his hate speech, we did manage to come to a modern society where we decided that it was wrong. And in many cases, we've decided not to censor that type of speech, but we generally agree in our laws that acting on it is wrong. It's really interesting. In Luther's own time, it was very interesting as well because once Luther's effects had rippled across Germany, it led to a state where peasants were much more able to discuss with each other. Some of them became literate enough to write letters to each other complaining about how bad their lives were. This is terrible stuff. Luther didn't like it, no one else liked it. In fact, he wrote, this is the, the, the ironic point, he wrote pamphlets to the peasants while they were revolting, explaining to them why they should not revolt. So he's communicating with peasants that used to be illiterate, using writing as a way to try and reason with them. But they had already reasoned things out quite well and continued revolting. The lesson here is that freedom, even if it's made for perhaps different choices than we would expect, begets or leads to more freedom. Luther's choice, Wycliffe's choice, to make more religious freedom for people of their own faith, the ancient Mufti's choice to require Muslims to read the Quran, these were choices for religious freedom that ended up leading to choices for general freedom because they gave people freedom to think. So we'll leave the Bible soon, but here's one more parting shot. You can tell I wrote this more for English, for an English audience than perhaps for a German one. This is the King James Bible, and most English Christians have a copy of it somewhere. Um, it's a very expert translation of the Bible. It's beautifully done, it was printed and so on, blah, blah, blah. The interesting piece is that in the aftermath of Wycliffe's printing of, or Wycliffe's translation of the Bible, the church and state worked together and they decreed that no translation of the Bible and no religious work would be uh, written or published in England without the consent of the king. So, further translations of the Bible, there were more English ones after Wycliffe's Bible, obviously, required the king to give his sign off on them. One of the last kings to do this was King James I. And here is King James against a red background, uh, and opposite him is George Villiers. And these men had an interesting relationship because it was supposed to be a homosexual one. And the interesting piece was that King James decided to defend himself and George by using a quote from the Bible, or sorry, not by using a quote from the Bible, but by using the Bible. What he said was this. I wish to speak in my own behalf and not to have it thought to be a defect. For Jesus Christ did the same, and therefore I cannot be blamed. Christ had his son John, and I have my George. So, this is a reference to the Gospel of John, the biblical work we've kept touching on again and again. And it's based on a very interesting interpretation. And the interpretation is that the Gospel of John depicts an erotic relationship between Jesus and John. Now again, I think if we were going back to the uh, uh, time when the Gospel of John was written, it's quite likely 
that um, the writer did not think, I'm going to have this describe some hot love between Jesus and John. Probably not what was on his mind. Because King James had authorized such a masterful and accessible translation of the Bible, many people were able to read, read it, not just priests, and say, you know, I don't think this means quite what you say it means. I mean, I'm reading the same text here, but I just, I just don't feel the love coming through it. All of this work of approving Bibles made kings tired. And to get around it, they ended up creating what, is, what was called the Worshipful Company of Stationers and Newspaper Makers. This was a group of, well, printers who were given the exclusive right to print any work in England. Whether or not to print something, how much to print, when to print it, and so on. They were also given the power to seize any book that offended the crown, or was likely to, to burn the book, and to turn the writer over to the authorities. A tremendous amount of power. But then we started to see an interesting change. Part of it was, I think, economic. And let me look at one thing here. Oof. So I'm running a bit late. Uh, I'm going to skip one or two points, so don't mind if I sl slip over a slide or two. So I'm going to skip why the change happened. Pardon me for that. So there was a key change, though about copyright policy. The printer's monopoly was broken in the end. And this happened about the same time with this collection of other freedoms that we think also were related to writing. So one of them was the Diet of Turda. This was at about the start of when printers were given mon a monopoly in England. This was uh, uh, an edict, uh, so a decree issued by a, a group of clerics meeting in Romania, and the decree was fascinating for the time. The decree was that no one may be expelled for teaching uh, any particular religion. Really progressive stuff for that area of Europe at that point in history. Um, ten years before, they had made roughly the same choice, except they had said, everyone except for Calvinists. We will put them to horrible, bloody death, but anyone else can, can teach what they want. So this is real progress. Another key freedom at the time, this happens just after, about ten years after, the printer's monopoly breaks, the Statute of Anne is issued. And this is the base of, in the West, modern copyright law. It gave authors a 14-year monopoly on pieces that they wrote, but it required something very interesting. If you wrote a book and had it published, you would get a 14-year monopoly, but only if you gave five copies to a series of libraries around the country. It suddenly meant that, so this is a, a British law, by the way, it suddenly meant that Britons had a great way to study all of the written works if they traveled some distance to reach a library, at least all the written British works. A really important thing for society. Here's another one. Here's the uh, First Amendment uh, in the US, another important and interesting document. Along the way, so we've started going from having not much freedom. We've gone from millions of years to thousands of years to now hundreds of years. We get up to the start of what we consider sort of the modern age. So let's say the 19th, uh, the, the start of the 20th century. And we start seeing that we slide back a little bit where We've developed freedom of the press in some societies. We end up, as we get new technologies to express verbal communication, choosing to limit who can use those new technologies. In most countries in the world, we end up setting something up that is like, well, depending on where we are, it's probably called something like the Federal Communications Council or something like that. It is a government-endorsed agency that chooses who can and cannot broadcast, which is a step back. Broadcast media is only an extension, only a technological extension of spoken language. So I'm going to leave this for a moment. I'm going to leave verbal communication. I'm going to panic at the sight of five minutes. And then I'm going to go into the next uh, segment of the presentation. So over most of the last 40,000, 50,000 years that we've had language, we have had one revolution. That was language itself. Every other change has been just technology. However, about 400 years ago, we saw the inkling of the next major revolution in communication. And that inkling can be expressed here. This is a jacquard head. The jacquard head 
is a programmable machine that can run a cloth make another type of machine, in this case, a weaving machine. The jacquard head was fascinating because it allowed an expert human being, in this case, a master weaver, to put down their expert skill into a concrete form that a machine could replay at a later time. This is fundamentally different from language. Language lets us share ideas. This machine let us actually share a skill and let someone without that skill use it at a later time. We've had other machines that were something vaguely like this before, like an abacus. But an abacus doesn't let us replay human skill. An abacus lets us enhance human skill. Now, there are some arguments about how early we had the first programmable machine. Uh, some people say it happened with the time of the Greeks. Uh, but we know that it's still, relative to language, very, very young. I think that we all know roughly the history of computing. L let's go to something that is actually relevant. So, who, who had a Commodore 64? All right. Who was born after they came out? <laughs> so this is great. Everyone is either, you know, you either had one or you're young enough not to. So once we started hitting the age of programmable machines, things sped up drastically. So 400 years ago or so, we have a programmable machine. By the modern era, we have a programmable general purpose machine that comes with stacks of people's recorded skills for us to use. My Commodore 64, I had a stack of disks, little black floppy things about, you know, this deep that contained hundreds and hundreds of hours of the expression of other people's expert skills. And I used it to uh, kill time in huge amounts. Um, <laughs> lots of load runner. So, this is really fascinatingly different than language because it lets us do some very different sets of things. Now, one of those things is the net. Um, it's amazing what we've managed to do in a tremendously short amount of time with a net. Almost every other medium that we have for distributing verbal communication, including things like television, which let us rebroadcast verbal communication along with other parts of a physical experience, has become mostly, or is becoming, mostly obsoleted by the net. It also, and this is the real killer feature, who cares about obsoleting other forms of media? We don't really need someone to obs obsolete other kinds of media. What the net does is it allows us to broadcast these representation of other people's skills to other people. In the space of about 50 years of having computers, we've gone from we have these massive things that occupy entire rooms and that are based on analog technology to we have tiny machines that are connected up by a network and we can easily use programs across most of them. Well, most is still an overstatement, but it's close enough. So what's the vision in all of this? Well, here's the first part of the piece. So, if we're thinking about society and language in software terms, language is the source code of society. It's not the compiler, that's us. It's not any of the other tool chain, but it is our basic ability to understand what happens in the world on some level. It's as close as we get. It's also our profound tool that lets us discuss many of the important matters in life. It's also a tool for creating other tools. We couldn't have created, arguably, a computer without something like language to discuss how to design it. It's too complex. But the second profound tool is programming. So why is programming the profound tool? Well, if language is all about thought and about discussing the abstract and so on and letting us build other tools, then programming is the precursor to probably machine life. In the same way that language booted us up as a species and created us, we can be pretty sure that programming will end up creating one of the next species on this planet, the one that we end up creating. It's also, of course, an essential human freedom because as our computing systems get more and more complex and govern more and more of the things that we do in our lives, it becomes much more important that we're able to study them. If we go back to the peasant in the Middle Ages who can't read the Bible and must do what the church tells him to do, has no ability to discuss or think about the issue, he is in the same state 
as the person who cannot look at the source code of the voting machine and determine what it does. He's in the same state as the person who perhaps writes their translation of some great work in Microsoft Word and then finds that when that version of Word becomes obsolete, perhaps they can't recover that great work. Someone else controls their intellectual tools. We have control of language now in most free societies. We are able to use language to freely discuss the wonderful ideas, the trivial ideas, and the horrible ideas. We don't have that freedom in programming just yet. We're working on it, but it's so tremendously new that we're not sure how to get there. Free software is the way to get there. It provides us a way to make sure that we carve out the freedoms we need to develop as a society. So, thankfully I've seen the end slide, and I have, I think, two slides left, and I could even skip one of them. So, when I've given this presentation before, I've had people come up and say, so what do I do? Who do I protest against? And if you want suggestions, I can make a list. I love when people want to do things I tell them. But the practical thing to do for most of us, now, advocacy and so on still matters, but the practical thing to do is build freedom. Make the same choice that the muftis and the translators and the ancient Jews and so on made. Choose a little bit of freedom in your own software development activities and trust that it will spread. Use free software licenses when you publish things and know that it will benefit society as a whole. Advocacy matters, but action, I think, matters even more. Advocacy matters in cases where there's some sort of legislation that ends up limiting software freedom. But in general, doing is the most effective action. And at that point, I think I can wrap up. Thank you. Thank you.